Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to our third screencast on SpeechX. The previous screencast in the unit built up our core theory of SpeechX, focusing on the concepts of illocution and perlocution, and with special emphasis on the extreme uncertainty that often surrounds the question of whether a specific speech act was actually performed by a specific person in a specific instance. The present screencast is going to carry forward those themes of uncertainty by considering two cases of legally governed speech acts, both of them related to people's constitutional rights in the United States. And both of them are drawn from Solon and Tiersma's wonderful book, Speaking of Crime. Let's begin with the Bustamante case, a famous one that relates to the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Solon and Tiersma frame the discussion with a provocative question. They write, why, indeed, would any rational person ever agree to let the police search his possessions? At best, you will be forced to stand by and wait while suffering the indignity of having a stranger ransack your personal belongings. At worst, the police will find incriminating evidence and use it to send you to prison. So, why, indeed? Like Solon and Tiersma, I believe we can actually understand why this happens to rational people. Let's first consider the legal background, which I've again summarized based on Solon and Tiersma's analysis. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures, as I said, and this means that the police must obtain a warrant showing probable cause unless there is evidence that a crime is in progress. Okay, so that sounds good, but we might, of course, wonder about what kind of evidence will suffice to create an exception here. Uh, anyway, cars are treated somewhat specially, but even there, the exception is triggered only if there is evidence that a crime is in progress. Now, this is referring to the motor vehicle exception, which says that drivers have reduced privacy expectations and thus can be searched without a warrant if there's probable cause and items in plain sight do not require probable cause. Look, I would not even pretend to know the limits of this exception in practice, and that's really part of the point here. But anyway, absent a warrant or in-progress crime, police must ask for permission to search a car and the occupants must freely and voluntarily consent. So, in our terms, we want to see two speech acts performed. The police should make a particular request, and people need to freely consent to the request. All right, so now we turn to the Bustamante case, which happens to have been local to Stanford here in nearby Sunnyvale. Joe Gonzalez was the driver, and Robert Bustamante and Joe Alcala were passengers, and Alcala was the brother of the car's owner, and they were driving in Sunnyvale. They were stopped by Officer James Rand on the grounds that something was wrong with the headlight and the license plate uh, light of the car. Two other policemen arrived on the scene for a total of three. And I think that's significant. There are now a lot of police on the scene for what sounds like, at best, a minor issue with the car. At one point, Rand asked, does the trunk open? And Alcala replied, yes, and then got the keys and opened the trunk. The officers eventually found stolen checks in the trunk of the car, and these were linked to Bustamante. So Bustamante appealed on Fourth Amendment grounds, and the case climbed up through the courts until the Supreme Court ultimately decided that the search was constitutional. Okay, so those are the facts. For us, they immediately raise a lot of difficult questions. First, what was the intended illocutionary force of Rand's utterance? This should be the crux of it, but this is essentially unknowable. We have no direct access to Rand's or anyone else's intentions. Even our own intentions might be hard to identify and articulate reliably. However, it seems safe to say that Rand did not intend the force of his utterance to be that of a command. That force would likely contravene the Fourth Amendment, since a command from a police officer would be inconsistent with the requirement that consent to search be offered voluntarily. So thus, we might grant that the degree of strength of the illocutionary act needs to be more like a request, since the preparatory conditions for a command just aren't met here, right? A command would misfire, probably on constitutional grounds. Next question, what did Alcala likely perceive the force of Rand's utterance to be? Well, this is also hard to determine, but it seems worth entertaining the idea that Alcala perceived Rand's intended force to be that of a command, albeit one phrased in a polite way. Solon and Tiersma asked, why indeed would any rational person ever agree to let the police search his possessions? Well, the answer is that rational people can feel unsure of what police officers are empowered to do, especially given the uncertainty surrounding legal precedents in this area. Police officers are empowered to command us to do many things, so why not this? 
right? In our terms, this all traces to uncertainty about the pragmatic presuppositions inherent in Speech Act preparatory conditions surrounding these cases. It's also possible that Alcala merely perceived the question to be a request, right? If Alcala believed that there was nothing incriminating in the trunk, which is easy to imagine given that the police had to search really thoroughly and found just some bad checks, then complying with a request may have seemed like the safest option, given, again, some uncertainty about which speech acts police are actually empowered to perform. What perlocutionary effect did Rand's utterance have on Alcala? Well, we did sort of observe this, right? He opened the trunk, and that's interesting. We don't, though, know what he intended to happen after that. It seems like he could reasonably say that he was merely demonstrating that he gave a truthful answer to the question, does the trunk open? which would not in and of itself be an invitation to search the trunk, at least not directly. What was the degree of strength of Rand's utterance? Well, again, we don't know, but Rand would say that it was a request, and he might observe that the Constitution forbids him from going all the way to the strength of a command. What is the role of preparatory conditions in our understanding of this discourse? This may, in fact, be the heart of it. Everything turns on what Alcala thought about the context in this sense and how that may differ from what Rand knew the context to be. What role might the maxims have played in shaping Rand's utterance, his intentions, and Alcala's response? Well, assuming the trunk was not obviously damaged in some severe way, the question, does the trunk open, has a trivial yes answer, and so that construal of the question is likely to be ruled out by the Gricean maxim of quantity. In such situations, request interpretations of questions like this are very common. And that might argue in favor of Rand actually having made a request, even though we have to set aside the power dynamics that might lead to someone thinking that it was a command. And finally, how does all this help us understand Solon and Tiersma's central question quoted at the start of the section? Well, it has everything to do with all the uncertainty that I just highlighted. Essentially, no one knows what officers are empowered to do and what they aren't. And this gets tangled up with the fact that they might not always invoke their power. For example, they might use an indirect question where they could have issued a command, just to be polite. Who really knows? Stepping back, though, I think we can see that in these contexts, the courts recognize a lot of pragmatic enrichment. An officer needn't say, I hereby request to search your car in order to make the relevant request. And people needn't say, I hereby consent to your request freely in response. This is all very natural at some level, but it's going to play out very differently in our next case study. The heart of this next case study is the Davis Supreme Court case, and I'll again rely on Solon and Tiersma to summarize. They write, These findings suggest that the legal system should begin to recognize indirect requests for counsel, just as they recognize indirect requests by the police to search a car, and just as they recognize indirect acts of consent by suspects. That's what we just saw. At the very least, law enforcement officers should be required to explain, once a suspect has raised the right to counsel, that his request will be respected, and that if he wants to have a lawyer present, all he has to do is say, I want a lawyer. That's Solon and Tiersma talking. They continue, the law is now settled and contains no such requirement. In 1994, the year after Ainsworth's article was published in the Yale Law Journal, the Supreme Court held in Davis versus the United States that a suspect's statement that maybe I should talk to a lawyer was not an invocation of the right to counsel, adopting the literalistic threshold of clarity approach. The court also held that interrogating officers were under no duty to ask clarifying questions, emphasizing that unless and until a suspect makes an unambiguous or unequivocal request for counsel, the police can continue questioning. The ruling was especially aggressive in rejecting the clarification standard, which the government itself had agreed may be the best path to take when a suspect makes an equivocal invocation. The difference here from the Bustamante situation is that indirectness on the part of suspects is not being recognized if it doesn't serve the goals of power. It was fine for the police to be indirect in requesting the right to search and fine for people to consent indirectly but you have to be maximally direct if you're invoking your right to counsel. And indeed, it seems the only safe thing to say here is, I hereby invoke my right to counsel. Bring out that hereby to make it totally explicit. Because courts have variously ruled that all of the following fail to invoke the right to counsel. Maybe I need a lawyer. I think I need a lawyer. 
Didn't you say I have the right to an attorney? Wait a minute, maybe I ought to have an attorney. You guys are trying to pin a murder rep on me. Give me 20 to 40 years. That final one is remarkable because of how clear it is about the context of utterance and the intentions of the speaker. Now you might ask yourself, why are people being so indirect when the stakes are so high? And I think you'll find that the answer to that question is easy, right? People resort to these indirect tactics with police officers due to numerous issues relating to power dynamics, politeness, and uncertainty about what the law actually is. You might have heard about the famous case of the supposed lawyer dog. Here, the suspect said, I know that I didn't do it, so why don't you just give me a lawyer dog, because this is not what's up. The headlines were about the idea that the suspect failed to invoke their right to counsel because of the phrase lawyer dog, which a Louisiana judge said was referring to a canine attorney. Now, this is indeed an absurdly uncharitable construal that would seem to open the door to everyone being responsible for even very implausible construals of their utterances. So it's just very sad and clearly disingenuous that anyone said they were assigning that interpretation. But for better or worse, the real essence of the case is that even where the utterance is parsed with dog as a term of address, it was still likely to run up against Davis versus the United States because the suspect's utterance was so indirect in its overall strategy. To round this out, I just have to issue one more reminder. All of the following have been interpreted by courts as successful instances of police requesting that they be allowed to search people or their motor vehicles. You don't mind if I look in your trunk, do you? Do you mind if I check it, meaning luggage? Do you mind if I take a look? Can I have permission to search your vehicle? And in many of these cases, a simple yes response was deemed to count as the speech act of consenting to the request to search. So the normal standards for being indirect with one's speech acts are being applied in transparently different ways, depending on whether those normal standards would serve the interests of the powerful or not. That seems like an inescapable conclusion from looking at these two related case studies that have such different outcomes when it comes to being indirect with one's speech acts.